Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is Steve Wilson from the Private Well class, and welcome to our uh, monthly webinar. Um, we have a special webinar today. Um, we have uh, guest presenters, um, Alex Hall and Fran Kremer from the Office of Research and Development at US EPA. Um, they've been working for a number of years on a project trying to determine the number of private wells in the country. Um, it's something that, um, boy, honestly, I met one of your colleagues, I think, in 2015 at the um, Groundwater Protection Council meeting where he presented, and that's how I found out about this. But it's, uh, you know, it's really changed the amount of uh, private wells that we realize are around the country, which some of us thought, but no one could really uh, show or prove. And today we're going to learn all about that. Um, so a couple of things for uh, homework real quick. Um, uh, today's webinar is um, still part of our series of, for our program with RCAP, and again, that's funded through US EPA. Um, like our other webinars, we are recording this webinar, and uh, it'll be available in a few days um, on our YouTube channel or in our uh, video section of our website. And um, if you have questions today, um, I'm sure a number of you that are on the call today weren't quite sure what today's presentation was going to end up being about, and you're going to learn a lot about uh, some new stuff they've done. Um, so if you have questions, um, put them in the chat box or the question box. And uh, Katie Buckley, who's also with us today um, from our team, uh, is monitoring those, and we'll put all of that together uh, in a file that I can share at the end, and we'll pull those up on the screen after we get through the questions that you all asked in advance and uh, we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. If, if you are a um, EHP or sanitarian, um, this is worth one hour of credit through NEHA and for Illinois LEHP credit. And the webinar today is gonna probably be closer to an hour and a half, but it's worth one hour of credit. Um, you can see in the handouts page, there's a certificate of completion, and then there's an agenda, which I know some of you need. Um, when you put your forms together, as usual, send those to uh, info at privatewellclass.org, and um, yeah, we'll um, we'll help you get that all set up. Um, we've had some issues. I'll just mention it here. Not that I mean, you all are all on the webinar, so you're not going to uh, uh, need to worry about this. But um, anyone who watches the webinars that are recorded, um, you can't get credit for watching the recording, you need to be attending live. And uh, that's so that we can track, you know, GoToWebinar has a bunch of cool features that allow us to see if you're paying attention and uh, how long you're actually on the webinar. And so uh, that's the only way we can verify that you're really here. And so, uh, yeah, make sure that if you have other folks that are interested in this afterward and you share it with them, they won't be able to get CE credit, but it's still uh, probably very worthwhile for them to uh, participate. So um, with that, we're gonna, change over the screen here. I'm going to make Alex Hall the presenter, and um, I want to introduce both Alex and Fran real quickly, real quick. Um, okay, so um, for uh, as far as the bio, um, Alex Hall is a ge geographer in the Office of Research and Development at the Center for Environmental Solutions and Emergency Response. He's responsible for the data analytics and the development of geographic information system tools and addressing source contaminants and, and impacts on water quality. His work has included the development of a national database and web mapping application for storage tanks and private domestic wells, and the development of tools to prevent contamination of source waters to protect public and private water supplies, which is what we're going to hear about today. Um, Fran Kramer serves as a, a senior scientist in the Office of Research and Development Center for Environmental Solutions and Emergency Response. A fan works with uh, agency program offices, regions, and states, and public-private partnerships to further research and its implementation and managing contaminant sources to protect water resources. Fran's been uh, instrumental in uh, providing uh, us with up-to-date information, and we've been following their work. And Alex, uh, all yours. Great. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Um, I don't know, Fran, do you want to take it away and we can kind of go over the, go over the overview and uh, we'll start? Okay, that sounds good. Um, well, good afternoon or good morning, depending where you're at. Um, thanks uh, to Steve and, and folks there associated with the WOW class and uh, RCAP2 for all your efforts and the invitation for today. 
Um, we certainly appreciate the energy and the support you bring to this issue and, and, and particularly the, the community you, you've built around this, which is, is important on many, in many ways. Um, so in the next slide here, we'll just give you an overview of um, what we're going to cover here today. Um, so at the top, we'll go through a uh, uh, description of the methods uh, that we've developed in really getting a good current snapshot of the private domestic wells by census block in the country. Um, and then associated with this, uh, there's an application that uh, Alex will, will demonstrate to you too that is um, uh, publicly available. And so you can use this um, as is or download the data um, and he'll walk you through the application. Um, important as well then is then how do we take that data and how do we understand uh, what our contaminant sources and how do we put that in context with where, where our wells are and the radius of influence to those wells. Um, so we're going to cover a range of contaminant sources uh, being underground storage tanks principally focused on gas stations which are a, a significant source of concern for private domestic wells. Um, likewise, septic systems and um, some of the data associated there and what to think about um, more broadly looking at CAFOs um, and as well mining operations, um, uh, particularly the mining and just the landscapes that they cover and the distance that the, those contaminants can go. And then we'll move into some uh, brief description of our Superfund sites and RICRA facilities and their potential impact, as well as uh, bulk storage facilities um, especially the above ground storage tanks um, that contain oil and hazardous substances and where they are relative to our private domestic wells. And the last but not least in this category um, cover some of the issues uh, associated with um, uh, road de-icing. Um, and then lastly, we wanted to also put this in the context of climate change. So given our future and particularly with flooding both inland and coastal, um, what does this mean with regard to potential impacts on our wells? And so, as you'll see, the, the way that this geospatial information is provided, it really gives you a new lens to look at the location of our wells and in the context both of uh, these contaminants of concern and, and climate change. Great, thanks, Grant. Uh, so I'll start off here. And uh, let me start by kind of describing uh, why and how we undertook this effort to estimate private well dens density uh, nationally. Uh, the why is, you know, we didn't have a good understanding on where our well infrastructure was located and uh, concomitantly what potential threats these water supplies may be exposed to, right? Um, to understand the potential exposure, uh, we need to know the geography and proximity of wells to sources of uh, contamination. Now, how did we go about estimating well density? Um, some of you uh, may know that in, in 1990, the U.S. Census, or, or the, uh, the long-form census, uh, asked, where do you get your water supply from, you know, a public or private source? Uh, this was really the last time we had a good understanding of where our wells were located. Uh, well, it's been 30 years, and there's been population growth or decline in certain areas, uh, population migration in that time span. So, we set out to kind of both update and spatially refine these estimates from the 1990 census. Okay, to do that, uh, we use two methods, and you can see that on the right. Um, one uh, is a st statistical model, uh, we describe that as the NHU method, and then, uh, well, no, sorry, <laughs> that was the RW method below, um, and this method was used to validate, um, is, and this is empirically based. Um, so let me start with that one, the W method. <clears throat> uh, we searched for all 50 states' driller log data, downloaded it, you know, looked it over, and basically, if a state legally required well permitting uh, before 1990, and the state reported accurate locational information, uh, these records were used uh, in our empirical model. So what did we do? So we took the 1990s as the baseline, and basically just as an additive approach, we added the, all the trailer logs from 1990 to 2010. We put them in both the census blockers and census blocks. Uh, so that's kind of empirically based, right? We know a well is in point X, we know it's in census blocks X, so we just kind of add that up from 1990 to 2010. 
Now, the other method is a, uh, basically a statistical kind of approach. Uh, we start with looking at the domestic ratio um, of, of uh, housing units in a census block and census block group. And what's the ratio of people on public versus private water supply? And then we take the 2010 census and we basically, well, we, we start with the assumption that that ratio is gonna remain pretty static. Um, and then so we just update based on the number of housing unit change, uh, both decline and uh, addition, uh, from uh, 1990 to 2010. And then we can come up with these new estimates. I should say with the RW method, the empirical method, we, we, we were able to do for about 20 states where they had good driller log information um, from 1990 to current. So what do we find with you know, combining these methods? Um, <clears throat> Well, I guess let me first start with, you know, how well was our, how, how well did our assumption perform? The assumption being that the domestic ratio uh, people on, on, the ratio of people on wells and public water supply, how did that, how did that fare? Was that a good assumption to use in our uh, model? Well, here we can estimate it uh, by comparing our empirical model down here at the bottom and our statistical model on the left. And we can see that many states, there's very close correlation between the two, right? I think globally between all 20 of these states, um, we have like an R squared of like 0 0.7, 0 0.87, sorry. <laughs> so, I mean, so we're pretty confident that um, for the 20 states uh, with the well logs, we incorporate that into our model. In the 30 states, we use the statistical model that, co uh, that corresponds uh, in reality very closely. And we can look, you know, state by state, at our new estimate, our updated estimate of you know housing units using wells. Um, at coming at number one would be uh, North Carolina, followed by Florida, Michigan, and then we can see the, the the method comparison here, where we see that these are you know very close. So that's um, that's kind of just a quick kind of background on on, on the methods used. Um, and then, so what do we find, right? So in in 1990. Uh, the census told us that there were 15.1 million housing units on private domestic wells. So it's about 15% of the population. But we, using our methods, you know, for 2020, we now estimate that there's 23 million housing units relying on private domestic wells. That's 52 million people and 17% of the population. And this map on the right shows kind of the, the growth and decline of our wells uh, geographically. Uh, the brown represents a decrease in well use from in that 20 year time span and blue uh, signifies an increase. And we can see some kind of geographic trends that you know closely relate to um, population shifts in the country. Uh, so at that point, yeah. So let me kind of show you this, this application of the data. Um, and this is publicly available. Um, I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, so this is the kind of the landing page, and there's a lot of data in here. So I mean, there's uh, let's see, uh, about 200,000 block groups that we have estimates for, and 11 million census blocks, um, which is you know very small geographic unit. So let me just start by zooming in somewhere, and we'll take a look at Indianapolis. And here we're looking at uh, private domestic well density. Right, so here we're looking at uh, housing units uh, uh, per square kilometer. Um, you know, the purple is you know 40 or more, uh, and white is you know none. Um, things get a little bit more interesting and refined. Well, refined, I should say. If we zoom in further, you know, we get a, a, a finer spatial resolution. Before we were looking at block groups, and now we're looking at blocks. Um, and there's a couple of different ways we can kind of look at the data, right? Uh, I can go over here into a, in this uh, layer list, and I can say, well, I'm not interested in density. I want to know the actual number of wells in an area. I can click on a, a block group, and I can see that there's 80. We estimate that there's 89 wells in that in that single block. Sorry, that single block. Yes. Um, so that's the number of wells. We can look at population search. Does my 
community or my block or block group, is it 100% reliant on wells or 0% reliant? Well, black here represents areas of 100% reliance on private domestic wells, and white is a uh, public. I mean, so I should note that you know, this is not just a really good tool to see where wells are, but by subtraction, we can also really kind of delineate the public drinking water um, infrastructure, right? Where the uh, the municipalities is serving the area of uh, uh, public water is kind of shown in white here, right? Um, we can uh, also look at kind of the change in, um, in in housing units relying on wells. So this we're not just looking spatially; now we're looking temporally at well use over time. Again, uh, red here is a decrease in wells, and blue is um, an increase. And you can really kind of look at the uh, the uh, suburban ring of Indianapolis had a big increase in the reliance on public, uh, on private domestic wells. Um, so that's kind of the, the four ways of looking at the data. Um, and each you know each one we can look at at two different resolutions: the block group or the block. Um, and this really gives us a really nice spatially refined picture of, of you know where wells are in the country. Um, and I'll put the um, I'll put the the link to uh, this map in, the, in in the chat here later. And then Fran. Um, so yes, then what do we think about this data and how do we consider this? Um, so in terms of uh, some of the existing recommendation for. Uh, private domestic wells. Um, CDC has defined um, some of the setback distances um, to consider uh, more broadly, uh, ranging from septic systems to CAFOs and um, uh, leach systems in general, and as well underground storage tanks. Um, when we think about uh, the certainly the, the geology, including not only the, the soil type and the slope, uh, a range of factors. Obviously, there's a lot of variability in the susceptibility of the, the private domestic wells. Um, we're actually presently working on a groundwater vulnerability model that really incorporates a lot of very specific information to get some better estimates about potential impacts um, to uh, water sources. Um, and as well, uh, many uh, states uh, have a different approach of how they think about uh, sources of contaminants and impact on, on private domestic wells. And probably a, a very uh, poignant one of uh, concern uh, and uh, uh, actually a very progressive approach in how they're looking at is, is the state of uh, Texas. They actually have uh, a policy in place where once a contaminant plume is identified from a source, um, the owners of those wells um, get notified by the health group within Texas uh, DEQ um, to enable them to make a decision then about the quality of that well. And they are looking at notifications for distances uh, for wells that are at a half a mile from the leading edge of the contaminant plume. And so I think as you look across the country and begin to think about the, the range of options that are being considered at a state and, and also a local level about these distances and notification, um, I mean, these are important things for us to keep our eye on and think about um, that data. Um, in a parallel fashion too, of course, the American Academy of Pediatrics is very focused on nitrates and in particular methemoglobinemia or blue baby syndrome. And so, of course, nitrate is, is a, a major one of concern for infants in, in a household and how we react to um, really responding to those uh, types of conditions. So it's very much a function of the contaminant of concern and, and obviously the distance to the well and how we look at these uh, different sources. Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in here and uh, you know, um, let's, let's take a look at kind of the intersection of uh, leaking underground storage tanks and private domestic wells. Um, if there's a release from underground storage tank, probably the, the main 
a vector of concern would be a, a private domestic well, just given the sheer density of wells, and then just the, really the prevalence of leaking underground storage tanks. I, I should say um, there's been about uh, 2.2 million underground storage tanks installed in this country. Um, relatedly, uh, there's been about half a million releases from associated with these tanks. I mean, if you do the math there, that's about one in four leaking uh, underground storage tanks um, is uh, has a reported a release. Um, so, and you know, currently, uh, there's about sixty thousand uh, leaking underground storage tanks remaining to be cleaned up in this country. And so, what we did is let's take a look at this map on the right. Uh, basically, we wanted to look, you know, within 1,500 feet of all these active releases, all 60,000 of them. And 1,500 feet is just kind of a kind of rule of thumb about kind of the upper, typically the upper extent of a, of a leaking underground storage tank plume, you know. The main cause of concern would be uh, benzene because it's carcinogenicity. Um, and here we're looking at the number in this map, the number of private domestic wells within 1,500 feet of all the all the releases. So you can take a look at Florida, there's about 60,000 wells that are really close to leaking underground storage tanks, you know, followed by uh, North Carolina with uh, 36. Um, so this is kind of uh, a, a big issue of concern um, for our um, Office of Underground Storage Tanks and our Office of uh, Land and Emergency Management at, here at the EPA. Um, nationally, we estimate there's about a quarter million wells within, um, you know, near a leaking underground storage tank. And so what's driving this, uh, as Alex mentioned, is uh, benzene. And we have, in terms of the fuel constituents, it's benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene, or BTEX, as they're collectively known. Um, and with benzene, um, as Alex suggested, it is a, a, a potent carcinogen. And we have, for a drinking water standard, a maximum contaminant level set at five micrograms per liter. If you look at the third column here, then, and just looking at a general composition of fuel, and this varies depending upon the type of fuel, um, but for discussion here for a, a more typical fuel, the benzene concentration really drives what we do on our sites and how we clean up the sites. If you look at the ratio of the benzene compared to the MCL, we're looking at an attenuation factor of about a million. And what this means is we're looking at um, a separation uh, from the source of contaminant and the well, and we're looking at ways to really minimize um, the ability of that contaminant to reach that well. And that's frankly at this ratio and this attenuation factor, I mean, that's a tall order. So distance is, is our, our best ally in um, looking at these concentrations um, at these levels. Um, I just want to pull, point your attention, too, to the idea of what are the odor and taste thresholds for benzene. So these are orders of magnitude higher than what the drinking water standard is. So if you smell or taste that, you're going to be well above um, the MCL for um, uh, benzene in, in the actual uh, water sample. Um, the other one that we're also um, concerned about at old legacy sites um, are uh, what we call lead scavengers. And these are fuel additives that were in fuel to basically protect the, um, the combustion engines from the lead. Um, and one in particular is called ethyl uh, uh, benzene, or so sorry, EDB. Um, and this particular one has an even lower um, MCL, it's 0.05. Um, and so as we look through our sites and we know where we have had leaded gasoline used at these facilities, and Alex will show you in a little bit um, an associated app, it's called Usfinder. And within that app, you can go in and particularly look at the age of some of these facilities and figure out, okay, are, would there potentially be um, problems with EDB? Would there potentially be problems even with lead from leaded gasoline at, at these particular sites? So anyway, this gives you a bit of a context here in terms of thinking about um, uh, these facilities. 
Alex, I don't know if you want to show us Finder at this point. Uh, yes, thanks for reminding me. Yes, indeed. Um, so let, let me pull that up. And again, just like the, the well map here, um, us Finder is also uh, publicly available. Uh, this is uh, this map is really the first national snapshot of our underground storage tank and leaking underground storage tank infrastructure. Um, before this was released, I don't know, what was it, a year and a half ago, two years ago, um, all of this information was not kind of compiled nationally. It's um, these are state delegated programs. So this application really allows you to, to get a national snapshot. Um, here we're just kind of aggregating all the data up and we're looking at leaking underground storage tanks by county. You know, the red is high with over 500. Um, we can zoom into anywhere in the country and really get a better sense of the you know, spatial distribution of our leaking underground storage tanks, both past and present. Uh, what you're looking at here, every uh, dot on this map represents a leaking underground storage tank. The, t the, the pink ones represent a leaking underground storage tank that's been closed for the, the state issued a no further action. And the, uh, the red here are active leaking underground storage tanks. And uh, you can see that, you know, in the Chicago area, there's uh, you know, not many blocks that haven't had a, or do have a leaking underground storage tank. Um, you know, we've got a lot of information in here that we can find out more about the release. You can click on any location and uh, see what, the, what the, the name of the company was, uh, the reported date. So this is an active leaking underground storage tank that was recorded in 1993. Um, so it's been you know many decades that's been sitting active. Um, we get information on on, on you know people who live who live there and um, in some instances the uh, substance release. Um, I don't think it's in this one, but um, we actually we also have some kind of handy kind of tools here that allow us to kind of query the data in terms of like what we're interested in looking at. Right, so I'll just zoom out a bit and uh, click this filter button. And so a lot of you are uh, definitely interested in private domestic wells and, and potential contamination to wells. So we've got this tool in here. And what we can do is say, of all the leaking underground storage tanks on, on my screen here, uh, show me Show me all the ones that have at least 10 private domestic wells within 1,500 feet. And I can query that. And so now we kind of are highlighting kind of the exurban ring of Chicago where there's definitely private domestic wells. And as we can see, there's uh, leaking underground source tanks. And you know, so click an individual point. And here we estimate that there's 17 private domestic wells within, uh, within this site. Uh, there's a lot of other tools on here. We can look at um, leaking underground storage tanks that are within a floodplain. You know, this can definitely um, exacerbate the contamination plume. Um, so these are all the sites within a 100-year floodplain. Um, and we can also look not just at the private water side, but also the, 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 the public uh, drinking water infrastructure. Um, I, can, I can just click this and I can say, show me all the leaking underground storage tanks that are within a source water protection area meaning that the that there's a surface water intake for public drinking water consumption uh, that that these tanks are th these leaking in our storage tanks are with, within that source water protection area that it would basically drain into that intake um, so that's one side of the coin the, the other side would be the tanks and facilities themselves so here are all the underground underground storage tank facilities and we can do the same type of querying like we did with the uh, the, the releases. Um, I should say that you know a good number, probably a plurality of our leaking underground storage tanks, they were kind of discovered uh, due to the removal of the underground storage tank, which means that you know there was a, a active release um, that you know wasn't you know reported until the tank was removed. So uh, we also want to show you know. Uh, given that context, where our underground storage tank facilities are. Um, and so blue here are uh, facilities with at, uh, at least one open underground storage tank, and the, the pink here are closed uh, facilities with no active underground storage tanks. Um, and again, we've got a lot, a lot of information in here, but let me show you kind of um, how to look at the individual tanks. So I clicked on a facility, you know, gas station, 
um, I can go down here and I can look at the capacities of the here four tanks at the site. So we've got a couple of 10,000 gallon ones and a 12,000 gallon one. Um, and let's get more information about those individual tanks. I can just click show, show this to me in a, in a table. And as, as Fran mentioned, um, you know, a, a good kind of uh, indicator of, you know, what, whether there's uh, that this site contained leaded gasoline uh, would be definitely the installation date and uh, what type of substance. So here are three open tanks. They were installed in 1985 where, um, you know, lead gas, gasoline was still being sold in 1985. And this was um, uh, containing uh, gasoline. And these are very old tanks and they're still active. Um, so that's, you know, good information to know. Um, and there's a lot of tools in here. A um, lot of, you know, a lot of data is like uh, 34 million data points in here. Um, encourage people to look at it if you're interested in tanks or wells. Um, and maybe I'll just stop there. Uh, thank you, Alex. And so we spent a bit of time here on the underground storage tank uh, discussion because it is a, a really critical concern with regard to private domestic well and, and water quality. Um, and I think really the, the effort that we are uh, trying to move towards is, red, is better communication between our worlds of cleanup and our folks um, who work at the front of public health and who have oversight um, on private domestic wells. Uh, and we see that that communication doesn't always readily occur, and that could be at the national level, the state level, or even down to the local level. So we really are working to bring these um, communities together. And I just mentioned briefly a little bit ago about um, what Texas is doing in terms of providing notification to um, the private domestic well owners. Uh, and in a, a recent analysis they had done, uh, the notifications that they provided from 2017 to 2020, there was over a thousand notices given to the private domestic well owners. Most of those notices were due to um, leaking underground storage tanks. So we know that you know we've got to get our arms around this issue, and we know that we also have to improve this communication uh, amongst these communities, uh, both on the public health side and the cleanup side as well. Okay, so we're going to shift now into a uh, discussion of septic systems, which of course is um, uh, one of concern um, at the EPA. Um, this is uh, taken on some heightened importance for a lot of reasons. Um, one, uh, in, within the infrastructure bill, um, there are certainly going to be appropriations for um, uh, private domestic wells as well as septic systems coming, and I'll uh, speak to that a little bit uh, later on, but particularly for septic systems um, and how do we look at this. Um, and equally important, um, similar as Alex described with regard to our private domestic well data, our septic system data at a national level is the, the, the button is back at 1990. So that's the last national data set that we have. So indeed, we're working on um, methods to um, update that data. And again, going back and using state data to validate that information. Uh, so septic systems in general, of course, these are very localized conditions that really control the movement of any contaminants from uh, a given system. So where we find the private domestic wells relative to the septic system, and that could be at a given um, uh, residence or it could be in, a, in an area where we find a higher density of private domestic wells and septic systems. How we design this is absolutely critical. And, and certainly what we see too is sometimes indeed the, the septic system is designed with the leach field upgraded from the private domestic well. Um, and so, yeah, I think here again, we're dealing with an issue of getting communities to talk with each other to ensure that there's appropriate communication in, in just the initial design on these systems. Um, but ultimately, we're looking at um, a, a way to uh, look at the attenuation of these contaminants 
and then to begin to think about what is the time and distance from the septic system to the private domestic well to ensure that we're not picking up the contaminants in, in the well. So how we consider that is that design is absolutely critical. And then in the next slide, um, just to, wanted to, to, co to cover two, just in terms of looking at um, a variety of contaminant sources. And this is some work that Laurel Shader has done um, out on Cape Cod, looking at a variety of, of contaminants coming from um, septic systems. Um, this has been a, 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 an excellent piece of work that looks at the various constituents and how we are considering again the range of these types of contaminants and their movement um, in, in within the systems overall. Um, so here we as well need to be thinking about um, these the concentrations and the vertical distance that we have from the leach field down to the groundwater and is there adequate attenuation capacity in, in that vertical and lateral um, gradient to prevent the impacts on the wells. I think one of the encouraging things that came out of that study too is that they demonstrated that nitrate could be potentially used as a screening tool for organics in general. And that, it, the, the, looking at that further detail, if we can come up with a, an approach that would think about the behavior of the other organics and being correlated to nitrate, from a monitoring point of view, and particularly for the homeowner, um, that can certainly shed some light and importance in, in understanding the, the movement of contaminants as well. Okay, let me let me jump in here, and we'll, let's look at the kind of the, the co-location of our septic systems and our private domestic wells. I um, mean, Fran outlined the, the importance of that uh, previously. Uh, so let's look at uh, any of the either the, the pink or, or yellow dots on the map. Um, those those locations are census block groups from 1990, um, where 80 percent of the households in those areas, at least 80 percent of the households in those areas, had uh, both a septic system and a private domestic well on site. Right. So um, these are really the the areas of the country that would be potentially most affected by. Um, you know, this uh, nutrients contamination, E. coli, and the like. Uh, we can definitely see some uh, geographic trends here, um, definitely in the uh, upper Midwest and the uh, eastern seaboard, uh, Florida, um, and, you know, a lot of the kind of Oglala aquifer area in the, in the Midwest. Um, uh, there are, so we estimate that there's about um, 17 million people living in these areas of high co-locations of septic systems and, and wells, right? So that's kind of the, the big takeaway here. And we can look at this uh, kind of graphically in a different way. So this graph I'm showing, every every kind of light transparent dot there uh, represents one of the 220,000 census block groups in the country. And on the left is the percent of that block group on septics, uh, you know, on-site septic. And uh, the bottom here is our percent well use, private domestic well use. And you can, you know, pretty much immediately see this kind of barbell shape of the data. What this is saying is, you know, if if you, uh, you know, generally, if you, you don't have very many wells in an area, you typically don't have very much septic uh, systems, right? That's where you get this big cluster here. And uh, opposite of that is, you know, if you've got a lot of wells in an area, you typically have a lot of septic systems up here. So I just kind of wanted to highlight kind of that that, that dynamic or that relationship between these two. And here we just wanted to give you some general background with regard to nitrate overall. Um, so our Office of Water um, assembles nationwide data uh, under the Safe Drinking Water Information System, and they catalog uh, a variety of very specific um, contaminants, and, and in this case, uh, specific to our maximum concentration level, again, the drinking water standard. Um, so on the left side here is a compilation of data from 1994 to 2016, and it shows you the average annual number of groundwater systems that had uh, nitrate violations. So you can see um, just geographically here where some of the areas of concern are. 
Um, on the right-hand side, alternatively, gives uh, approaches then to looking at predicting where drinking water impacts um, may occur um, specific to uh, nitrate violations. Um, again, this is a function of a, a lot of different factors that go into this, but it gives you here a snapshot of um, regions in the country to think about uh, in general where uh, we need to be focused on, on nitrate concentrations. And relatedly, uh, we want to spend a little bit of time um, just looking at confined animal feedlots and the uh, potential um, concern related to private domestic wells. Um, just using two states um, only as an example to give you an idea of um, the issues that the states are considering. Um, North Carolina um, has over 2,000 swine feeding operations alone, and those are, um, you know, near 26,000 wells. They're within a half mile of these CAFOs. Uh, so it's a pretty high number of private domestic wells. Um, and if you look then in turn at the um, average percentage of the well use on those block groups where a CAFO is present, um, that's sitting at 65 compared to some average at a state level at 35%. So we know these wells um, you know, are vulnerable in, in some of these situations uh, overall. In um, Wisconsin, alternatively, um, this has uh, been an area in Kewanee County, Wisconsin in particular, that had uh, has had um, significant impact on private domestic wells near some capos there uh, due to E. coli and, and nitrates. Um, the last summer, actually, the Wisconsin Supreme Court ended up ruling that indeed the state has an, uh, the ability to enforce water quality standards uh, for the private domestic wells using the permit conditions for the CAFO. So it gives homeowners the ability now uh, there to begin to look at their private domestic well and ensure they've got um, uh, improved water quality um, as a result of this. Um, and I guess I should note at the top, uh, in a previous slide, we saw that um, North Carolina had the most housing units, you know, relying on, on, on this unregulated water source, uh, private domestic wells. Um, and, you know, also uh, North Carolina has, you know, one, one of the, the largest um, CAFO uh, infrastructure in the country as well. Um, and, and this isn't surprising, but I, I, you know, I kind of want to drive it home. Um, you know, we have CAFOs in rural areas, right? rural areas you've got a lot of private wells and you can just see that by you know the darker blue areas more, more wells and then you can look at the the number of heads at these CAFOs you know up to you know 280,000 individual uh, uh, swine at, at these um, locations and you know you get to see with your eye that you know where there's CAFOs there's wells so I just kind of wanted to drive that point home <clears throat> Okay, so we're going to shift um, here into thinking about hard rock mining in particular. Um, the Government Accounting Office had at least released a report um, looking at abandoned hard rock mining um, operations and potential impacts on uh, water quality. We have well over 100,000 of these features and with over 22,000 of them, they know um, pose uh, potentially environmental hazards to public health in, in the environment. Um, and there's an, an even higher number where really these mines are not even identified. We don't know where they are. Um, so safe to say, yes, particularly out west where these features are found more predominantly, these are concern for private domestic wells because they provide a very direct conduit um, to the well from the sources of contamination. Um, as well in terms of rural and tribal impacts where there's little public water infrastructure and they are uh, specifically reliant on uh, private wells. Uh, and a study that was done looking at uranium and arsenic mines in the Navajo nation showed concentrations exceeding the drinking water standards 
um, at 13 and 15 percent of those samples. So that's a fairly high number and particularly of concern for these um, specific contaminants. Um, and what they've also shown here, and because of these preferential pathways in these conduits, um, in fact, they found some of the contamination uh, within six kilometers of the actual source of some of these mines. Uh, and so these are just inordinate distances that the contaminants are traveling um, to um, the private domestic wells. So how we think about contamination from these sources is quite different given the, the uh, conditions of the mines and the operations in, in these preferential pathways. And here, um, we just wanted to bring your attention to uh, the USSGS work in just identifying mining features overall. And this is a composite of a variety of mining features, but just to note um, the link here, and you can go through and, and uh, evaluate where some of these mines are. And again, this could be a data layer brought into the, the private domestic wealth app as well. Um, and so let me just briefly touch on um, uh, our private domestic well uh, geography and, and where our super fund, sorry, super fund sites are located. Uh, here we just kind of aggregated the, the, the data by, by by county just to, to visualize it easier. But uh, here are all the wells within half a mile of the super fund site, right? And so our, our dark blue areas, um, again, you know, kind of found in the upper Midwest and, and, and Northeast. Um, you know, have between uh, uh, 50 and you know about a thousand wells in close proximity to these really you know these contaminated sites. Um, you know, nationally there's about 50,000 of these within half a mile of our, our, our Superfund uh, locations, and you know that's serving about uh, 100,000 people uh, daily. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, and then also, you know, somewhat related, uh, we can look at uh, landfills. Now, there's different types of landfills, right? There's um, the recyclers, um, your, your standard landfills, and there's also something called, shown in green here, your construction and demolition landfills. Um, and these um, are typically unlined landfills. And uh, I know, that, you know, Fran did some, some work in post Hurricane Katrina, working with kind of debris management and um, I know you're uh, very familiar with, with CMD landfills. I don't know, Frank, do you have any other thoughts on those? Um, and just to add to this a, a bit, uh, the construction and demolition landfills are uh, very prevalent um, and they're found in, in many communities uh, that are typically operated by a, a local entity. Um, because they are unlined and in areas that are in the exurban or in, in some cases of rural fringes, um, they are going to be close to uh, private domestic wells. And so we have um, information just in terms of uh, where these facilities are located. It's um, so you can, again can add some of these layers into looking at where are the private domestic wells and what's the uh, uh, ability of those contaminants to move from these landfills into uh, a private domestic well. Yeah, and uh, you know, I encourage people to also just um, you know, Google the EPA's uh, National Disaster Debris Recovery Facilities. And it's a great tool um, and, and you can really kind of split the data up and really um, get to know the precise location of all, all the recyclers, landfills, and CMD of landfills in the country. So this is a really great resource provided by the EPA. Um, and, you know, there's a, a lot of people uh, relying on, on, on private water, you know, about, you know, close to 40,000 um, that are you know, near these lined and unlined landfills. Um, switching gears, um, let's, let's talk about um, above ground storage tanks. Uh, we covered underground storage tanks. Our above ground storage tanks are typically much larger than our underground storage tanks. I mean, you know, these things be millions of, or, or have a capacity of millions of pounds of substances. And it could hold a, you know, a, a wide variety of substances, from oils to oil like substances to hazardous substances, right? And kind of Louisiana is a good, a good case study for this. Um, now, within Louisiana, we estimate 
uh, or we, we know that there's about 7,500 oil and had sub facilities within Louisiana alone. Now, unfortunately, the uh, a lot of the state data is not publicly available uh, to show. Uh, so here we just um, are providing kind of a density map. And so we can really kind of see where our you know, hazardous substance uh, facilities are. Um, and, you know, this, this you know, obviously comes, uh, catches the eye, Baton Rouge, New Orleans. Um, this is colloquially called kind of Cancer Alley. And um, this, you know, uh, the, the distribution of these uh, has sub tanks and kind of give you a, a, an indication why. Um, there's uh, 378 unique substances stored um, in Louisiana. And uh, on any given day, about 5 billion pounds of, of these substances are stored, right? And these little black dots, every black dot on the map represents 50 people on, on private water. And, you know, you can see, you know, the co-locations uh, of, of these two kind of data sets. You can look at, you know, Lake Charles, definitely. Then, um, you know, in between this kind of corridor here, a lot of people are relying on, on private wells. Um, you know, then, you know, just in this area, about 120,000 people served daily. <clears throat> Um, that, that are within half a mile of, of one of these facilities. Um, and then uh, let's talk about kind of one of the most kind of ubiquitous um, issues, especially for north, northern states, and that would be uh, road de-icing, um, you know, salt solutions that are applied to our roads in the winter. I was making this map yesterday. I was even pretty shocked at looking at this data. Um, here we're just looking at 2015 salt application. And you know the blue areas here represent annually uh, between 300,000 and about a million pounds of salt um, applied to our roads. Um, and even these um, kind of light, be or the, this beige color here is between you know 50 and 100,000 pounds. I mean, pretty much every you know this map shows you know uh, you know pretty much every you know area in, in here in New York and in Pennsylvania has some kind of a salt application occurring. And uh, there's also a, a very, you know, very clear temporal trend where the application of salt is, what is this, tripled, quadrupled in the last you know, 30 years, 40 years. Um, and uh, you know, that's a very important part of this is that salt uh, mobilizes um, a lot of you know, heavy metals and other things such as radian, uh, radon, mercury, and lead, right? It can you know, further affect our water supplies. Um, you know, we also know that salt can cause blood pressure, hypertension, things like that. Um, some states do uh, require public notification of salt exceeding uh, 20 uh, milligrams per liter. And I should just point out, there's some studies done on this, and, uh, you know, New York State estimates that about a quarter of private wells were contaminated with de-icing salt. Um, and uh, there's a survey conducted where 70% of uh, participants Stop using the well water because of safety concerns from you know the de-icing activities. Um, so just just want to uh, make you aware of this issue here. Um, and then switching gears to to climate change, um, I kind of wanted to hone in on on one event, and this is Hurricane Harvey. And the the blue areas on that map are areas of sustained inundation post Hurricane Harvey in, in 2017. And, uh, you know, this is showing kind of the Houston area in the middle. And Houston has a lot of private domestic wells um, just right outside of the, uh, the major urban area. Um, this kind of represented in uh, purple here. And you can see that a lot of the sustained inundation happened where a lot of our wells are. And there were a lot of reports of uh, EPA Superfund sites getting just completely inundated. And, you know, uh, logically, the, the water was becoming contaminated and receded and, you know, could definitely get definitely got in the groundwater. Um, so, you know, we, we really kind of want to stress the importance of, of looking at uh, sea level rise, uh, inundation, um, both, you know, because of examples of this contamination at Superfund site, but also, you know, uh, uh, brackish water contamination of, of freshwater uh, supply. And, you know, we have quarter of a million private wells that were inundated uh, by uh, Hurricane Harvey rainfall. Um, what do, do, you, do you want me to show the, um, do we have time? 
glad we get through this and see if we have time to show the um, the inundation data in the, the well map. Yeah, that'll be good. Well, we're gonna we'll make it in five minutes. I think we're fine. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. So show it. Um, let, let's get through a couple of more slides here, and then let's show the the application with the climate change impact. Great. 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 Running a little bit long isn't a big deal. Okay. All right. We're all learn. Oh, all right. Okay. Thank you for the grace period. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I guess I'll just I'll just pop it up real quick. Um, So I just kind of wanted to uh, highlight some some things that we can do with our private uh, domestic well application. And you know, there's a lot of tools and, and data that we can kind of import into our um, in, into our map here. Basically, here we're looking at the sea level rise predictions by NOAA, and this um, takes into account um, stor storm surge, um, hurricane uh, inundation for Cat one through five hurricanes and predicted sea level rise um, up until 2030. So basically, the more red the color, the more frequent the in coastal inundation. Um, and you know, we can add any type of data um, in using this tool. You know, if we want to look at flooding, we can look at flooding. Um, so I just want to make you aware of that. And I just basically imported this layer into this map. Um, so that's kind of, the, you, know, you know, we can really look at the, uh, you know, the extent of predicted uh, coastal inundation, you know, especially in Florida here. I'm surprised by anybody. But you know, you know, importantly, we can look at the intersection of our coastal flooding and our official load, <laughs> our wells. Here we go. Right. Um, so that's kind of the the, the coastal layer. Um, oops. I also imported kind of a, a FEMA's um, uh, hundred-year floodplain data as well. So I'll just pull that out. So this is uh, our 100-year floodplain shown in purple. And you know we can also look at you know where our wells are in relation to that. And let me get down to the block level here. So just let it, making you aware. Um, back to underground storage tanks. Um, and this is more kind of in, in, in relation to the, this climate change piece, uh, basically, Kind of water is the kind of nemesis of our underground storage tanks, right? A good portion of our underground storage tanks are steel, metallic, that <laughs> combined with water, uh, you get rust, and then you, know, a, uh, leak, and then a, you get a leaking underground storage tank. Uh, here uh, is a map of our, all of our underground storage tanks within the theme of 100 year floodplain by state, right? So, I mean, you get like Pennsylvania with uh, 2,600, just sitting in a floodplain and most likely just kind of sitting in water. Um, trees, well, you know, a lot in Texas and, and, and Florida as well. You know, there's about a quarter of a billion gallons of fuel um, that's kind of sitting in, in theme of the 100 year floodplain. Um, so just, just really cover that. And then looking at um, just the wells and contaminant transport with, uh, in particular, groundwater flooding. And, and this is um, probably a mo more of the, the phantom that we have to deal with. Um, obviously, the surface water um, uh, flooding is very visual, catches a lot of attention, but the groundwater flooding is basically creeps up on us in, in, in many ways. Um, we indeed have um, some tanks that are sitting in the groundwater, um, and some of that is because there aren't many options in some areas of the country to prevent that. Um, but we also know, too, in, in certain uh, regions in the country, too, that the groundwater is uh, coming in at historic highs. Um, and so on the right here is just an example of Dane County in Wisconsin that shows some of these trends in the, the groundwater table. So um, if we think about these um, higher water tables and if you consider the range of contaminants of concern that we're thinking about and those sources of contaminants, basically what we're doing in um, having these rising water tables is um, reducing the um, treatment capacity and the areas of attenuation for these contaminants. So uh, particularly here on the left-hand side, the graphic just showing a septic system that you can envision that groundwater increasing, you're, you're really losing that treatment zone and that capacity to prevent uh, contaminants um, reaching a private domestic well. 
Likewise, for underground storage tanks, the same. If we have surface spills, and, you know, it's going to take a lot less to get to the groundwater table. Um, and as well, a related issue that we deal with this is um, the concerns where it's getting into the groundwater. We need that vertical distance to prevent vapors from getting into homes. So this is very much um, an issue at hand that uh, we need to be focusing on, looking at where the water tables are and really providing the needed protection uh, with the changing climate. And then as Alex mentioned too, just in, in encompassed in what he was looking at sea level rise. Um, so sea level rise absolutely contributes to uh, the groundwater flooding in these coastal environments. Um, and then with this brackish water and impacts potentially on our infrastructure, um, it lends itself to increasing uh, potential for, for leaks. So how we look at these sites, um, and in fact, we have a significant infrastructure. One of them is the above ground storage tanks that we described are um, uh, significantly impacted in Louisiana, Texas, and New Jersey. We have a high density there, and we have a high density of private domestic wells. So this sea level rise is absolutely something to keep um, an eye on as well. Um, and then lastly here, just very briefly, um, looking at public water supply infrastructure. Um, as many of you probably know in reading about what's coming out of the infrastructure bill, where we will be getting some um, support both for the private domestic wells and septic systems in the infrastructure bill. Uh, and so how we as a community think about um, where to consider um, this infrastructure, um, certainly the, the areas that we have um, considered uh, before and looking at where, where we have dispersed ho housing and small towns, you know, the economics um, have been challenging to say the least in some of these situations. Uh, but I think too, it's really working to um, look at these investments in line with the, the potential health, health outcomes. Um, and how we can really optimize the use of these expenditures in areas where we know we have high concentration of contaminants and or we have a high density of private domestic wells that the economics there um, certainly can shift. Um, and then last but not least too, just want to call your attention to the last item here is, um, you know, not unlike um, lead in public water systems, uh, the private domestic wells uh, also have um, uh, an issue related to this. Um, there was a recent work um, that Jack and McDonald had published looking at um, lead in homes for children. Um, and there's a, basically a 25% increase of elevated blood levels for children using water from a private domestic well and compared to those on public water supplies. So this is very much an issue that strikes home with our community and, and, and looking at private domestic wells. Um, and then lastly here, just want to end with uh, just, uh, you know, how, in terms of water testing, um, these are links here to the state certification programs and laboratories um, uh, across the United States to, to go to in terms of, of getting uh, good standard uh, water quality testing. Um, and lastly here, uh, some additional information to, to reach Alex and myself and uh, some of the information that we've provided uh, here. So with a few minutes over here, I'm happy to, to entertain questions and Steve and Katie. Yeah, let me um, change uh, to the screen here. Uh, uh, make presenter. And hopefully we're back to my presentation screen. Is that correct? We are there. All right. So, um, you know, as in all of our webinars, a number of folks ask questions when they registered. And so um, we've selected a number of those that um, we're going to answer. And so if you do have other questions, um, and it looks like we have a bunch. Oh, my. So we already have 15 questions that you've asked today, which is great. Um, I hopefully Alex and, and Frank can stick around and we'll do that as long as everyone will stay, but we'll start right now with um, going through the questions that we get. And as I mentioned, um, we won't be able to answer them all. Um, a lot of people signed up over the last few days, but um, we're going to answer, I don't know, eight or 12 or so, I think, today from what you've asked before. So I'm just going to ask the questions and Alex and Fran are going to uh, provide you with the answers and we'll go from there. 
uh, I'll try to keep my mouth shut. So, um, so first question is, uh, how are areas with public water identified? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I guess I can, I can take that. Um, you know, I, I kind of touched on it uh, when I was showing the map, and you know, that, that the map of, of wells by census block is not just a really good indication of well, where wells are, of course, but where wells aren't. And if there's a lot of people living in an area with no private domestic wells, well, we've got ourselves some public uh, public uh, water identified, All right? So I showed that example of uh, Indianapolis. And if we look at the, the percent of the population served by uh, private wells, and you know, a lot a lot of areas were zero. Well, that was um, you know in Indianapolis, um, and you could very easily identify the public uh, drinking water kind of extent. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so next question is, uh, can local county water resources departments add more detailed information to this tool beyond what is available at the state level? Um, clearly, I think you showed that can be done, but um, I'll let you answer. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so when I was showing those um, flood layers, yeah, at the top right of the map, you can add data, and you can pull in data that's um, published online. Uh, you can pull in data that's, you know, on your county or municipality, um, uh, a geo platform if you've got a GIS staff um, or if you've got uh, geospatial layers on your computer you can also import them in so really anything can be kind of overlaid with this um, uh, private domestic well data um, so, yep yeah yeah I actually just saw yesterday um, our cap solutions has used this tool already and and added some of their own layers to a, a feature set that they're using it's looks pretty cool for Massachusetts okay um, many of our town's residential wells are not in Mass DEP's database. So that's why it says question slash comment here, because a couple times uh, in this, they were not necessarily questions, but um, a comment. And so if you want to address that, that'd be great. Yeah, definitely. So Massachusetts required reporting of driller logs in 1989, right? So anything you know, drilled before that, we don't really have a good understanding on where those wells are in Massachusetts. Um, and that's why I think this this um, this method that we've developed is so you know crucial and important because it accounts for things drilled before whenever a um, a state required reporting, right? So uh, I mean that's that's why you don't have a lot of these things, uh, oh, a lot of the wells accounted for. So if you if you go in and download any you know driller log information from a you know state database, kind of the immediate assumption is that oh, these are all where all the wells are. Well, that's that's not necessarily true. That's where all the wells are that were reported when they were required to report, right? Yeah, and you know we talk about in our uh, webinars all the time. Uh, New York, it was 2,000. Um, in Mississippi, you don't have to report a wall that's five inches in diameter or less. Mm -hmm. And you know, versus Illinois, which was 1968, and a few other states are that early. And so it really is a you know it's because it's a state ran thing, um, all of the different rules, different laws, they started at different times, and it really is, uh, you know, it just depends on where you're at and uh, how diligent the state has been. Okay, uh, is my well on in the map? Our county and state do a terrible job of recording wells. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the second part of that was more of a comment. Uh, oh, I, 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 will, I will weigh in, <laughs> but know your well's not on the map. Uh, it's, it's aggregated into these, you know, what, what I described, uh, census blocks and census block groups. Census block groups typically have between, I don't know, like 800 and uh, 3,000 people. Uh, census blocks are much, much smaller, much less people. So going back to being able to add tools or add features to these, though, um, a number of states do have their well logs available online. I know um, our state, Illinois, uh, Illinois State Geological Survey has a... Um, a website, um, a GIS uh, web feature that you can get into and see all the wells in uh, the actual domestic wells. So you could certainly overlay those things that way, depending on what state you're in and what kind of data is available. Uh, do you recommend a method to determine permitted well density based on rainfall and geology and what other variables? 
do you work with government to determine and set limitations? And there was more to this. It was kind of a, another comment about government uh, that I didn't feel fit. I didn't feel fit on the uh, slide. So <laughs> stick to the yeah. question. <laughs> uh, it, it actually, it's, it, it is a good question. I think what we're looking at is um, re regional waterproofs who are uh, more aggressively trying to understand groundwater and groundwater management in a spatial and temporal sense. Um, and we see this in different areas of the country, not uh, not across the country uniformly, but yes, depending upon an area. And just a couple examples, um, certainly the Floridian Aquifer, uh, which covers all of Florida and some parts of Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, Mississippi, um, they are getting together to really look at um, the groundwater um, in general and considering particularly Florida has uh, multiple water management districts and they're looking at recharge, they're looking at withdrawals, they're looking at a variety of factors to be able to better manage that water. And as you've seen in what we have uh, just demonstrated here today, it, it's a good thing they're on that, both in terms of the, the reliance of private domestic wells, as well as some of the contaminant sources in Florida to be thinking about that groundwater quality. Um, uh, and then just another um, example too is the Edwards Aquifer. Uh, there too, they're looking at water level monitoring and rainfall and a variety of conditions where uh, that's uh, being impacted. So yeah, uh, folks are, are getting on, onto this issue um, and uh, we need to be thinking about this uh, uh, in a, uh, based on a, an aquifer and the, the demand and also thinking about this in a temporal sense and looking at population growth and how we can sustain those populations with um, the potential drawdown in the aquifer. That's great. Okay, have there been studies to determine if nitrites and nitrates from small lot well and septic systems have influence on density? Um, in general, uh, yes, the, the density of the, the septic systems are going to be potentially impacting the private domestic wells. Um, and so that's going to be driven by the location of the septic systems compared to the private domestic well, as well as a range of other factors, including hydraulic connectivity or slope. Um, that will uh, influence the uh, nitrate and, and also as well E. coli concentrations that may be showing up in, in the problem. Yeah, and, and I don't know of any studies, but I do know like um, with all the efforts in Massachusetts on septic systems, you have to, um, there's a lot more of the more advanced treatment going in because they're too close together and they can't actually have septic. So I think there are some efforts to actually uh, show where density can affect whether or not you can put in a normal septic system or not, in those cases anyway. Um, how do you account for the number of unpermitted and undocumented private wells? I think we've already answered this question. I know it, in my state, I'm guessing that only 30 to 50% of private wells are registered. Yeah, I think you, everyone's already talked about that already, so I'm gonna move on. Um, do any county health departments still test private wells? Um, and what we see is that um, dependent upon the local county health department, the answer is yes, there are some, but that's not um, uniform. Um, in particular is that one slide we presented, there's the certified um, laboratories that you can go to at a state level, but yes, there are um, county level departments. and. Um, I also just want to mention as well, we actually had uh, a citizen science project that we had uh, worked on before the pandemic. Um, and this is really designed to work with uh, our regions and the state and local health departments to bring in a class to the local high school to teach them about private domestic wells and to do some uh, screening approaches to looking at some specific contaminants 
Um, that's been on pause because of the pandemic, but I think you know there are groups as this, and, and one in particular that we came across was a, a county in Oregon that is the, the local health department is doing something similar. They're working with the schools and being able to implement some screening approaches. So if there are some numbers that are high, then they know to go ahead and really get the water tested in a certified laboratory, really to get some definitive answers about the, the water quality. So yes, very much the, the county health departments are on the front line of this issue. Yeah, and um, I'll add to that, that you know, one thing I've learned is that um, it really depends on where you're at in the country. Um, even, you know, out east in Massachusetts, Connecticut, uh, a lot of those areas, you don't have county health departments. You have local health districts that are based on a, a town. So, for instance, in Illinois, we have 102 counties, and I think we have 86 county health departments where some are joined together because they're not very populated. Um, in Massachusetts, which is only one-fifth the size of Illinois, there's over 350 local health districts each that um, have actually their own authority uh, in regulating wells. Some have their own labs um, that are certified. Some don't do any kind of testing and don't even have any rules for well construction. So it's uh, that's part of the problem with private wells around the country is all the rules are very different and it depends on where you live, um, whether or not um, what kind of protection you might have. Um, is there a TMDL for boron? What industries typically associated with boron contamination uh, are associated? I must have missed the word there. What industries typically are associated with boron contamination of private wells? Um, and for those who may not be familiar with that term, TMDL, this is the total maximum daily load. And um, this is a parameter that um, we look at that provides um, uh, a quantitative answer in terms of the maximum amount of a given pollutant that can enter in a water body um, so it meets the uh, water quality standards. Um, so these are set at the state level. Um, so under the Clean Water Act, each state um, develops these for their waters um, that are impaired and they identify some priority ranking uh, associated with that. Um, specific to boron, um, of course, then that's going to be dictated by the states. And uh, boron is both naturally occurring as well as anthropogenic. Um, uh, we have areas in western U.S. that have high concentrations of, of boron in the soils. Um, uh, but as well, um, it, it can come from industrial sources, um, from pesticides or fertilizer production, a, a range of, uh, of sources. Um, but what we are also um, looking at, too, is that the source of this can come from septic systems. Um, and as well, um, these are components in detergents. So um, there's potential that it could arise uh, from a septic system as well. So again, though, at the end of the day, in terms of the TMDL, these are state driven and, uh, um, you know, can ultimately, too, impact the private domestic well. Hey, thank you. Um, what are the concerns regarding higher sea levels and their effect on aquifers? Um, the sea levels are uh, going to be important uh, on several fronts. Uh, of course, you can um, imagine the uh, sea level rise and impact on uh, just the, the brackish nature of the water uh, is going to be a, a concern in and of itself. Um, as well, um, with the sea level rise and uh, just the salt content that lends itself to increasing the potential for corrosion in the infrastructure. And so even um, the materials associated with our private domestic wells, it could be piping that uh, depending upon the nature of that pipe, um, there may be concerns about uh, impact to the infrastructure from uh, those uh, materials too. And then ultimately, when we have sea level rise, that's also going to change, in many cases, the groundwater level. Um, so with the groundwater flooding and potential increased movement of contaminants from a variety of sources, 
um, we can certainly have mobilization of those contaminants that we historically may have not seen without sea level rise. So there's a number of reasons to, to be thinking about um, sea level rise in context with private wells. Thank you. Um, what happens with cases when wells are contaminated with too much nitrate? Um, so I think how we would approach this answer is um, indeed how we would think about contaminants in general. Um, however, specific to nitrate, obviously, as we covered a bit ago, in, in 10 milligrams per liter is um, the concern that we have with regard to hemoglobinemia and or blue baby syndrome with infants. So immediately, if you know there's a problem, stop drinking the water. Um, uh, and contact the local or state health departments to really confirm those results. And as well, there may be other people uh, or, or homes within proximity that um, may have an issue too. So they'll definitely have um, a, a heads up there to notify potentially other homeowners that may be impacted. Um, and subsequent to that, obviously the big thing is we got, then got to go figure out well, what's the source and control that source. Um, where is this coming from? Um, and then you're looking, of course, then at the treatment. And again, that should be coordinated with uh, certainly the state folks and looking at uh, the treatment options and getting a certified contractor in to really um, it, to put together a, a treatment strategy. Um, and then ultimately, it's, it's really about prevention. Um, so why this could occur, you can control that source, but what are you going to do to prevent this from happening again? And, uh, again, that comes back to what are the conditions that cause this? You know, is it the slope? Is it the depth? I mean, what are the, the things that you can do to really prevent that um, from happening again? All right. Okay. Um, so hang on, don't leave because we have a number of questions and it looks like Alex has been busy trying to answer uh, some of these, which is okay. Um, I'm going to pull them up on our screen here and um, let me move this over and make it full screen, and we'll just start at the top. It says, can you add to the discussion um, potential, contamina uh, potential contamination from agriculture? In particular, does aerial spray and pesticides have potential impact on water resources? Um, the aerial spraying um, can have an impact um, depending upon a, a number of the site-specific conditions, um, you know, where the spraying is occurring relative to a well, what's the, the slope um, uh, that's where the area is again being sprayed relative to the private domestic well, and what distance in, in general are we looking at with regard to the pesticides, and then ultimately is um, the frequency of the spraying and the persistence of a given pesticide and its potential impact um, on the water quality. Yeah, what we usually um, mention too is that uh, it really depends on well construction. You know, if you have, uh, the reason you test for coliform and nitrate is because um, they indicate a pathway into your well. If you have elevated nitrate or if you have coliform bacteria, you shouldn't have. And that means there's likely a, a breach in your well or it's not well protected at the surface. And so um, we get this question a lot from people who live near um, farm fields. And it really depends on uh, also the geology uh, and where you're getting your water from. If you, um, for instance, in Champaign County where I live, if uh, you have a well that's in the Muhammad Aquifer, there's over 100 feet of till on top, which is more clay and, and more of a re it retards water from running through it. Um, below, the, and then there's a screen down at the bottom. So if you have a sand and gravel well that has a screen at 200 feet and you have 100 feet of till and your well's properly constructed, it's very unlikely that you're gonna get contamination from spraying um, or uh, application of pesticides versus an, a shallow well or a sand point or an old hand dug well or a board well that gets its water from the water table, then you um, wanna be more concerned. And one of the reasons uh, all those things matter is because sampling for pesticides is really expensive. Unless you know exactly what pesticide has been sprayed on the field by your well, um, you probably need to sample for all of them, or at least a suite of common ones for the type of crops that are being grown. And uh, that could be um, hundreds or even thousands of dollars. And so it's good to understand your well and test 
um, and make sure um, your shore that your well doesn't have some kind of breach or crack or uh, isn't sealed properly with a good cap. And uh, those will play a, a lot in saying whether or not the, that spraying will affect your well and your drinking water. Okay, so the next question, um, increase in well use. So yeah, um, and Alex uh, answered this. Uh, it says 1910 or 1990 to 2010, but Alex mentioned 2020. Um, I was actually going to ask that question. So um, I was going to say, because um, it is for 2010, which uh, you've answered here, um, but I know the 2020 census is out, and I wondered if you had any projections, either of you, on what you think you're going to find. Are there more wells today? Are there fewer? Um, we see communities growing, but we also see states like Maine, where now they have more wells, more people on private wells than they do on public water, um, and it's growing in that respect. And so uh, just curious what your thoughts are. And it's, I'm great. I'm glad the 2020 census is finally coming out April 1. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, we've been, wait, we've been waiting for it. Um, so yeah, just, just, to, just to start there, yeah. So um, all, all the data we showed here are, are 2010 estimates. Uh, we're currently working on you know, doing this again for the 2020 census. That means going back and collecting all the state well logs again, uh, making sure that they meet our you know standards for uh, timing and locational accuracy. Um, you know, some people have asked, you know, why don't you update this based on the American Community Survey? Um, you know, they have housing unit information. Why, why do you have to wait 10 years to get the next estimate? Well, the huge, very large margin of error in, in those. Um, I think that margin of error on housing units is about 25%. Um, so we, we don't really want to use that. So we do have to wait for the census. Um, so that that's coming out. Uh, in terms of what's uh, what we plan to see, well, I mean, I, I should say there's been um, some studies and, you know, a lot of our public drinking water infrastructure was funded uh, and, and completed, you know, prior to 1990, right? That's kind of where the big thrust of, of public investment occurred in terms of our drinking water um, infrastructure. Um, I, and so I don't know if that's changed much. Um, I guess we will we'll, we'll see with our new estimates. Uh, and we'll, we'll we'll be writing a paper on on, on that as well. But uh, Fran, do you have any other thoughts on that? Uh, no, I think you've covered it. I think that's a good point about um, all the infrastructure work was really done early on when EPA was first formed, um, and there was such an emphasis on that. Um, certainly mm -hmm. after 2010, when earmarks went away, some of those. Uh, infrastructure projects also went away, uh, but that's a long way to wait, I realize. So, um, someone asked about a link to the tool. Can you point me to it? This is the link. If you go into the chat, um, it's already there. You can uh, cut and paste it there. Um, and I'm uh, going to suggest to Katie that when you send out the email uh, when the video is ready uh, in a few days, that you go ahead and add in the links that are provided uh, in these questions and uh, for this and the UST finder and, uh, and the other link that's going to come up here in a minute in the questions. Yeah, that's a great point. I can certainly do that. It's right here. Can you please share the GIS layer link? And that's, uh, I'll put this in chat right now. Yeah. So, so that's, that's not to the application, that's to like the, um, like the data. Right. Um, right. Right, the application is the well map uh, link above. Um, how are wells within distance from uh, leaky underground storage tanks estimated? Uh, census blocks are well permit inventory. Um, so yeah, go ahead, uh, yeah, Alex. Yeah, we, we use our, our block estimates. Basically, we, we drew a 1500 foot you know, buffer around each release, and then we basically tabulated uh, the intersection of our, our block estimates to that buffer to get that estimate. And obviously, you can look at different distances, as we mentioned earlier, about Texas is looking at a half mile. Um, so certainly, if you go into there and, and adjust that distance to really encompass what you may need at a state or a local level to address that. Okay. Um, are you considering naturally occurring contaminants such as arsenic and radon? Um, we like to use the USGS Mass DEP arsenic and uranium probability maps when advising our private well customers on potential health risks. And this know, one, are you familiar sorry. with uh, Mass DEP has a thing on their website where they've uh, I mean they've they've mapped the probability, and so any well owner in Massachusetts can go on their website 
and type in their address, and it'll tell them if they are if they should be sampling for um, arsenic or I thought it was uranium, um, but maybe it is very on. Anyway, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to suggest then you could just import that data layer into the private well uh, app to look at then the d density of the private domestic wells at a census block if you wanted to consider it that way. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, thank you. So uh, obviously the UST finder is already also in the chat. If you go into the chat, you can cut and paste that. Um, and it's just, yeah, it is a public, that's been out for a while, I remember. Um, and actually, um, you all gave a presentation at our conference last May um, on the UST Finder and, and the work you're doing. You covered some of that today as well. Um, but if you go to privatewellclass.org and look under, scroll over the webinar tab, you'll see uh, Private Well Conference. And you can find the 2021 conference links and on YouTube, um, their presentations are all there and freely available. Um, back to estimates of public drinking water, private domestic wells, I guess is what that's, um, yeah, getting my terms mixed up here. How well do the results correlate with survey results at the county level? I don't know if survey questions are consistent between states, but there should be a fairly large data set of counties with an estimate of households on wells and I'm not sure what BRFSS is. Um, yeah, I'm vaguely familiar with this, and this is, uh, I assume the question is relating to the CDC's um, survey that they, they conduct, um, and I honestly don't know if that survey does do this at a, a national level and consistently, and so in putting together our data, I mean, we've literally gone to every state to collect um, the information that's the most current private domestic well data that exists in the state. So um, we haven't come across this in particular that has the needed um, data that we were looking for on the private domestic wells, but I, I don't know who um, submitted the question, but if you have any further information or wanted to follow up with us on that, be happy to discuss that further. Yeah, and you can we can forward that to Fran um, and Alex if you just email us at info@privatewellclass.org or I'm sure they can um, find your information as well. So, uh, how often should a well be tested for bacteria? Well, what we recommend for the private well class is that you sample it once a year for coliform and nitrate. Um, again, they indicate a pathway into your well that doesn't mean your well safe from anything else like arsenic if it's naturally occurring but it indicates that you may have uh, some superficial uh, breach in your well, whether that be your well cap or uh, something else. And uh, anytime the well's opened um, is, or any time um, anything else out of the ordinary would happen, like a flooding event. Um, and we talk about that in most of our webinars and it's available if you look at some of our videos, you can see uh, a more complete kind of answer about that. So um, I don't know if you have anything to add, you guys, but that's really pretty standard uh, information uh, that's around the country, I think. Yeah. So next question, it may be yet disclosed, but are there similar maps, or is there a similar map showing PFAS and PFAS, or PFAS chemicals uh, known contamination? Um, and this is not from EPA, but yeah, the Environmental Working Group has a PFAS contamination map. Um, we were going to, Katie, did we include that in our newsletter? Uh, no, we had to take it out. So, um, and this is my, you know, so I manage the private well class. And so I made a decision not to include this link because, um, looking at what I know about Illinois specifically, the map's really incomplete. And in some states where there's a lot of information available, it looks like those states have much more of a PFAS problem than other states where there's not much data available. When that's not the case, it's a matter of what data they've been able to uh, to get a hold of. And so, um, I mean, it is a useful map in some ways, but it's very misleading uh, to me. And I don't know if you guys have any thoughts about that, but um, I chose not to uh, use the environmental on, and send it out in our newsletter. Uh, I, would, I would trust your judgment on that. I just, I just, had, I just ran across it at one point, and um, you know. no, sure, sure. 
Um, and also, regarding the EPA, that 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 news article there by the Guardian uh, discusses some of EPA's uh, data, although it's not publicly available. Um, that uh, that article kind of covers a lot of what that question is asking. Excellent. So we can include that as well um, in the Guardian one in the email we send out to everybody that's attended today. Okay, what does CAFO stand for? Uh, confined Animal Feeding Operation. Yeah, so um, I, just for the record, I grew up on a hog farm, but it was not confined uh, livestock back in the old days where we had everything on pasture. I, I wish I did this well in my, my college courses. I, I, I feel like I'm getting these right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, hopefully, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, the link to the mapping site did not work for me. I think, yeah, um, I think what your comment there, Google Chrome works the best. Um, I find that for a lot of things, if, yeah, you need to try several browsers if it doesn't work for you in the one you're using. Um, I think sometimes it gets bogged down. Just, just try it again in a minute. Um, yeah, there may be a lot of people on trying it right now. And the last part of that is what impact has um, relying on counties basically had and not having great records had on the survey. Um, I think you mentioned this about the 14 states you did use, but if you want to uh, reiterate. Yeah, yeah it's it 20 states. And I mean, I mean, there are two issues or two things that we had to like make, you know, account for. One is um, when they started reporting for the requirements for reporting had to be uh, 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 post-1990. And the second issue was just the locational accuracy. Um, you know, some, some states still use the PLSS system, you know, which is kind of a gridded system and they just put it at the center right of the grid. That wasn't accurate enough for us to really, um, to use. So we needed like GPS coordinates. Um, I'm just rereading this to make sure I answered that. Um, uh, so yeah, so we only had 20 states that were kind of, um, had really good logs. But again, you know, we validated that against our kind of statistical model and, you know, very tight relationship between the two. That's interesting. We um, we still use our well records from our Illinois Department of Public Health still um, have a place for uh, LPSS. Um, and a lot of, we even store, well, we, the water survey where I work, we store the state's well logs for private wells. Um, we have a big file room with about 500,000 well logs. We um we do convert everything for a long time. All the agencies in the state use Lambert, and so that was um, you know now that's kind of a, a trivial conversion in ArcGIS. But um, we even developed methods to take the land survey system and convert it to Lambert um, for most of the state where the sections and townships were um, fairly normal. Um, we're still dealing with the fact that some of those uh, are not accurate. <laughs> um, how did they collect this inundation data? Uh, yeah, they, they're referring to the, the Harvey inundation. I think it's um, Colorado State or University of Colorado, I forget, one of those. Um, it's called the Dartmouth Observatory, and they use, um, I believe it's MODIS or maybe some other uh, satellite imagery to, to, uh, to look at the inundation. So that's, that's where that data came from. So if someone were to Google Dartmouth Observatory flooding, or they'd probably yep. be able to find it that way, or heard oh, yeah. Are. yeah. Yep. Okay. Do you make these layers public in the ArcGIS online platform, as in looking them up in Living Atlas? Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's more of a um, uh, somebody knows GIS. So yeah. Um, basically, uh, you can pull these layers in from a like an Esri repository. So if you're like in RGIS, yeah, you can search for these layers and they're basically just sitting on the cloud and you can pull them into really any, um, pull them into your own maps. So yeah, just uh, if you're on the um, online, Esri's online geo platform, just search private domestic wells or us finder and you'll find them. Um, well, we get a copy of the slides. You know, we didn't ask for that, but well, we, we do have the video. Um, and that's really, I know, yeah, well, I'll let you guys answer. Um, typically, we do need to have the, the slide deck as at least a PDF so that folks can get their CPUs. And I probably neglected to mention that or ask that in advance. So we'll have to talk about that. Yeah, uh, no, no worries. No worries? Excellent. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So that means yes. Okay. <laughs>
Uh, to make a map to identify risk areas of daycares on private wells to keep children safe from exposures, what would you recommend to prioritize as in potential sources? Well, this is going to be a function of where your daycare is. Um, certainly in more urban environments, you're going to be looking at gas stations is going to be a driver um, as well. We didn't cover this today, but dry cleaners are a major point of exposure as well. Um, and if you're looking um, more rural, obviously, then it's going to be more of a focus on nitrates or, or pesticides. Um, but also having said that is to consider the actual daycare itself. We know of instances where an old gas station was converted to a daycare, um, which <laughs> is, is hard to comprehend. Um, yeah. But uh, so it really depends upon the environment and uh, where you are and looking at the, at the potential sources. Yeah, and I'll also mention that I received a phone call from a daycare that is across the street from the edge of a airport. And so they were concerned about PFAS. And that would be a concern if they're um, within throwing distance of, a, of an airport uh, property. Okay. Um, I'm looking for contaminant systems and other BMPs that can be that can help mitigate threats to water from above ground storage tanks. Ideally, I would like to require these to be used in industries, businesses as part of our unified development ordinance. Can you recommend a good resource that identifies these types of BMPs? Um, yeah, we have uh, specific prevention and response plans uh, for um, oil facilities in particular. Um, and whoever uh, requester is here, I'd be happy to, to communicate with you and send along the information there, particularly on the prevention side. Um, on uh, hazardous substances, um, this is an area where we have not had a regulation, um, and this is pertinent to the Clean Water Act hazardous substances. So if that is something you're interested in, actually the agency is going to be publishing this month in the Federal Register. Um, approaches to management of these um, large story facilities for Clean Water Act hazardous substances. So there will also be some um, components in there that would address this, but whoever the requester is here would be happy to send you information with regard to the um, ways to, to mitigate these threats um, for oil. Okay, uh, the next question is, could you share the drinking water lab link? Yeah, I can look that up in a second and throw it in the chat. And we can also include it in the um, in the email again. Um, we've shown that link a number of times in our webinars if you've attended in the past, but um, yeah, uh, it's on EPA's webpage. Um, or if one of you have that link. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pop it in there, just, just one second. Pop that in the chat and we'll make sure it gets in uh, the email that goes out with the video. Um, are there any maps available that show PFAS, PFOA, PFOS uh, contamination levels in Michigan? I think that's already been answered. Um, yeah. So uh, that's what we have for today. I really appreciate your time and staying uh, with us um, for all most of you who are still on here, as well as um, Alex and Fran. Thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot here for us to uh, to take in, and it's all uh, really useful. You covered a lot more topics than I realized you were even going to related to all the different potential sources and data that's available for those things. So um, if you have any other questions uh, for Alex or Fran, you can email us at info at privatewellclass.org, and we'll make sure they get those. Um, as far as your CEs and those things, um, same. Uh, email us at info at privatewellclass.org and we'll work with you to get those forms filled out. So um, if there are no other questions, um, when I sign off, it actually kills our link. So I'm going to lose you, Alex and Fran. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, I really appreciate your time and look forward to um, our conference in May, our private well conference. Um, we will be, uh, uh, we'll be speaking, at least I think you're going to be speaking there. Um, yes. On, on some of these issues. I'm, I'm sure you'll have the 2020 data done by then. So. Uh, I'll, do, I'll do a piece, Steve, <laughs> no problem. Because, because you asked. Just so everybody knows that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. All right, hey, thank you. Uh, thank you both. I really appreciate you uh, participating today and, 
and sharing what you've uh, learned for, with all of us. All right, take care. Thank you as well, and certainly welcome any additional comments or feedback from folks. I appreciate it. All right, take care. Bye.